lift those hands right now where you are. Lift your hands. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to run over. As you lift your hands in his presence, God, we are available for another download. Download, Holy Spirit. Download into us what we need for the next leg of this journey. Holy Spirit, teach us. Deliver us. Grow us. Mature us. Use us. Be glorified in our lives. We lift our cups. We lift them up. Fill us up. Fill us up. And make us whole. Now come on and give the Lord the best worship out there. Come on, open your mouth. Hallelujah. good ground tonight. This is holy ground. This is good ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just witness to somebody. Tell them we're standing on holy ground. Hallelujah. Come on. Just, just walk around. You're on holy ground. Just walk around. Walk around. You're on holy ground. You're on holy ground. God's getting ready to manifest some things right here in this place tonight. He's getting ready to manifest some things right here in this place. Tonight! Tonight! God, do it tonight! Do it tonight! God, do it tonight! Hallelujah! Glory to God! That's right, just walk around in the anointing. The anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I am so honored to be here with you, Bishop, First Lady, and the family, all my new friends I met. Uh, I just will tell you, I'm just down to earth, me, so we're going right in, because this, this worship, the worship sets the atmosphere for the word of God. And I'm on assignment, so I honor God for who he is in my life. I honor him. I thank him for my wife, my children, my family, my church family, my personal assistant. I just thank God for everything he does. Because he does all things well, doesn't he? Doesn't he do all things well? Now watch this. I thank him for my enemies, too. I thank him for the folks that did not want to see me make it. I thank him for the haters. Come on here. Because if it weren't for the haters, I wouldn't be standing here to give him glory. So I can say that nobody but God did what he's doing in my life. Can somebody say that? Nobody but God. Nobody but God. Nobody but God. And he gets the glory. He gets the honor. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory. I'm going to worship us so y'all didn't set it off in here. I just love it when people come to worship. No formalities. I'm just so honored to be here in a place of excellence. When I walked in, I felt something prophetic. I start to feel like you're really preparing for the next season. The next season of inflow. Those flowing in. Um, the word I have for you, for this house, is regarding your rooted in faith. You may be seated. I'm going to go right in. Um, 
Matthew 13 and 31. Let's take a look at that for a moment. Matthew 13. And it says, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of what? Mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Like the kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. I want to start by just saying, acknowledging this, because I know we all know this, that whenever Jesus talks in parables, he is speaking concerning spiritual things, but he's talking to carnal people. So when we hear parables, we shouldn't get relaxed and just assume, oh, we're getting ready to get a story. But in re instead, we should ask ourselves, what did we not get? That the Lord has to talk to us in parables about spiritual things. Because I recall other instances when Jesus talked in parables, right? And after he had finished, his disciples asked him, why did you talk like that? And he said, well, because it's for you to know the mysteries. It's for you. Look at someone and tell them it's for you to know the mysteries. Okay, I'm telling you, we're not talking to babes right now, right? Am I, am I correct? We're talking to folks that sure enough are rooted in faith. So that means that we don't have to go in and explain the details. You should be getting something in your spirit the moment we started talking about the seed. Let me tell you what you should have got in your spirit. First of all, the first thing that should have hit your spirit is that the mustard seed is the tiniest of seeds. But he likens the kingdom of God to the tiniest of seeds. The kingdom of God is likened unto the tiniest seed. Now, you know, with the natural eye, if you take a look at that seed, you wouldn't think much comes out of it. But as tiny as it is, it has on the inside of it a blueprint. Which is why you should never uh, uh, underestimate what God can do through little moments. Small beginnings. Okay, it doesn't, and, and in fact, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Let me say this because I felt this in the spirit when I came into this city, into this area. I heard the Lord say, we're not looking for another Walmart church. This ain't no come and shop and get what you want. This is, God's looking not for mega, he's looking for mighty. He's looking for mighty. And I heard the Lord say, don't get discouraged in this season because you might have a whole lot of Walmart type churches around you. He said the size of the building does not determine the impact it has in the kingdom. The tiniest of the seeds has such potential. In fact, the Bible tells us in several other scriptures that that equates the same parable that when the seed is sown, once it's sown, right? Then it has the potential to become so large that even the birds of the air find a nesting place in it. That's this ministry. Amen. That what seemed to be so small has within it the ability to be so large. Come on, come on. All it needs to be is planted. Yeah. Well, well. Planted. That's, that, that's the first step that it has to just be planted. When I was a kid, they had, well, I would go to the store with my grandfather because he was a landscaper. And what I liked so much was before we leave the store, we go by this little uh, turnstile that had all of these packets of seeds. And I got excited because of the picture on the front. Because the picture says, this is what 
is inside once it goes through a process. I'm, I'm asking you to take a look at somebody on your row. I'm not trying to get you all excited, but look at that person on your row. Imagine what's on the inside of them when they've been through a process. So, so we would always pick up some seeds and I would go home and take a Dixie cup and I'd go out in the yard and I'd put some dirt in it and I'd put some water in it and mix it up like mud and then I'd put the seeds in. Y'all follow me, right? And every day I would sit there and keep watching and watching and nothing was happening. And so one day I decide I'm gonna just dump it out. And my grandfather said, what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna dump it out because it's not growing. He said, it is growing. He said, anything that's growing has to take root first. He said, it's gotta take, he said, see, the, he said, the life, the life of the plant is in the roots. And he said, he said this to me, he said, you got to understand that some things are not going to come above ground until they have been rooted beneath. And I remember saying to him, well, how much longer? He said, it depends on what it's going to produce. Now, I got this is for somebody, if you catch this. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a what? You can do what? Move. Do you know why he says that? Because mustard seeds can grow in some of the worst places. A mustard seed can grow on the side of a mountain and grow to the point that the roots of the mustard seed begin to break up parts of the mountain. See, we were thinking that he was saying in the natural, if you got faith, you can tell the mountain just be moving, it's moved. But no, it's the mountain moves when you plant something permanent. Come on. Come on. I, I, I. And I, I'm sorry, I'm hearing this word right now. And you shall be like a tree planted by that brings forth this fruit in its season. And whatsoever you do shall prosper. Your leaf shall never wither. That means that you look good in every season. You produce in every season. Even a bad season, you produce even in a bad season. Somebody tell somebody, I'm going to produce even in a bad season. See, this is why, this is the difference between mature Christians and wannabe mature Christians. The wannabes have a bad season and then they act just like it's a bad season. But the Bible tells us those of us that are planted by water, every season is a good season. Even when you don't have fruit, you got leaves. So I want to talk for just a few more minutes about being rooted and in faith, okay? Uh, give me a second. I'm getting used to using an iPad. I'm one of them writing my notes on envelope on everything, right? Give me one second. Let me open this up here. All right. I wrote a couple of notes for you. And one of those notes is that when we consider the roots, we must, have to, we must understand that the presence of a tree is sign of a root or roots that aren't always visible. But if you look at the fruit of that tree, it can determine for you what kind of tree it is by the fruit it bears, right? Another grandfather story. 50 years ago, we moved into a house and my grandfather planted a tree, a little twig in the front yard. It was so timid, he had to tie it 
with posts. And every year, we had storms, we had hurricanes, we had blizzards. But the interesting thing, after all of these years of seasons, that tree was growing. At some point, he took away the supports. And that tree kept growing. But something my grandfather did that I've learned today why he did it. That tree started growing to the point he would get up in a ladder at what seemed like the most fruitful time. And he would start cutting branches off. And my grandmother would look out the window and she would knock on the window and she said, man, stop cutting on that tree. And my grandfather said, old woman, go on, mind your business. I know what I'm doing. I'm talking about not in the winter season. In the summer, in the season when it looked like this tree is so beautiful, he'd go up in that tree and start cutting down branches. And my grandmother would fuss every year. Until finally he said something to me. Because I was out there with him one day. He said, look, boy. He said, I'm going to tell you why I do this. He said, because if I prune it, it's only going to get stronger. He said, one day, if I keep pruning it, Come on. he said, eventually, the tree is going to grow upward yeah. on its own yeah. well, well. without any grooming. Yeah. I want you to know, four years ago, my wife and I returned back to that house I was raised in, and we bought that house. Yeah. We bought the house. I wanted to keep my grandmother in a good facility. She, would, she needed round-the-clock care. And so instead of selling it to someone else, we bought it. All right, all right. Well, when we got there to the house, and I said, we're going to remodel the house so that we can raise our children here, I noticed something in the front yard. That tree. No, it wasn't a little twig. It wasn't even a semi tree. It was so large. And then I heard the Holy Ghost say, look up. And when I looked up, all of these seasons where my grandfather had passed on now, this tree has been growing without any care. Because the years of pruning. Come on here, somebody. See, we got to be like that tree. Sometimes God has got to prune us. And you know what he does? He proves us in the season where we don't feel it's fair. I'm fruitful. I'm anointed. Why is pastor correcting me? I'm the one that's doing it. I'm the one that's doing that. Why am I being disciplined? So you can produce more. Now that tree was growing upward, not one limb on the ground. And then, guess what? Right when we finished remodeling the house, we had a flood in the house. Watch this. I was like, no way, no way. We, 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 we gutted the whole house. We didn't change everything. So we called the plumber. He came back, he said, Bishop Coast, I'm going to have to do something that I didn't do. I said, what is that? He said, I need to run a snake through your pipes outside the house. And it had a little light on it. And as he ran it through, he showed me this little camera. He said, look. I said, what? He said, you see that? I said, yeah, what is it? He said, tree roots. <laughs> 
I said, tree roots? He said, that big tree out front? He said, it's been grown all through the pipes. He said, and if, if we don't cut it down, it's going to grow up in through this house. I said, you mean the roots? He said, listen, let me tell you something about trees. When they find a source of water, they only go deeper. Hey, come on. They only go deeper. They don't uproot and run. They don't get mad and leave. They go deeper. How many people in this room are ready to go deeper? I'm ready to go deeper. I want to say this. Your roots, your roots, Bishop. Prophet, it's your roots. Your roots are a sign that you've been through some seasons. It's a sign that you have endured seasons that would have uprooted you, yeah. would have destroyed you. Yeah. You know, when 9-11 happened, something happened concerning a sycamore tree. I'm a Jewish uh, student of the word. I studied Jewish prophecy and times and seasons. And one of the things that happened during 9-11, seven buildings fell. But one building in the midst of them was not touched, and it was a church. And in particular, it was the very church that George Washington went into and got on his knees and dedicated our country to God. Now, in the Bible, when you see sycamore trees, they are indicator of sin, the sin nature. There is a particular verse in Scripture that talks about how when the people of God had sinned, God began to say, cut down the sycamore. Do you know, in the midst of all seven buildings that came down on 9-11, a sycamore tree that was in the front of that church was uprooted. God was trying to tell our nation that he's sick of our sin. Now, you know what man did? Because sometimes we don't understand the spiritual. You know what they did? They took the roots of that tree and bronzed them and put it down on Wall Street. How prideful can we be? You know, every tree that is planted isn't planted by God. You see, there is a law of reciprocity at work. Whatever we sow, we have to reap it. I'm going to tell you something I learned from 30 years of pastoring. There's a formula. It takes two years for people to reap what they sow. It's a formula. It takes two seasons. The first season, it looks productive. Because the mess ain't full grown yet. <laughs> but oh, when the second season comes around, what they've sown, they must reap. I'm going to give you this. Almost done. We must consider that roots are a sign of seasons that have been endured. It is also a sign that there is a way to nurture the tree because it has roots. You know, my grandfather taught me that you can always tell when it's going to rain because even before there's a cloud in the sky, the leaves turn up. Some country folks, come on here. 
He said the leaves turn up. It almost they change a lighter color because they turn. Because even the leaves know it's about to rain. Now here we are. Trees planted by rivers of living water. But we can't discern the season. We don't recognize that we're in a season that we need to turn our leaves up. Because God's getting ready to rain. He's getting ready to rain. He's getting ready to cause there to be an outpour. There's about to be a pouring, a pouring, a pouring, a pouring. There's about to be a pouring. Rivers about to come through some deserts. Come on, somebody. Rivers about to flow through some deserts. But you got to stay planted. Because here's what happens when you uproot something that's meant to grow in soil. When you uproot it, you run the risk of putting it in soil that is not of the same quality. This is why people go from place to place but don't grow. They, they, they go from one place to another. They don't stay anywhere long enough for the take root. But worse than that, you see, the soil is what has the ability to break the seed. Soil and rain causes the, soil, the seed hard shell to soften so that the embryo, the seed, can begin to take in the nutrients that causes it to germinate, to mix with the soil. So in other words, when you've been in the ground long enough, your identity starts to dissolve. Right? You can tell folks who've been in the ground because when you've been in the ground, we don't see you. We see the results of you dying. Dying. So the last thing I want to say about roots, that when you are rooted, you are not easily uprooted. Because there's a relationship that trees form beneath the surface. Their roots get entangled. So you can't pull up one without pulling up another. Now do you understand why some folks aren't satisfied with just leaving? I'm just I'm telling it like it is. 30 years of passion, I know in year 17 what's happening around 15 to 17 to 20. I'm telling you what I know happens in the church. People get up and roll out, but the ones that roll with them, it's because they've been entangled. The Lord ain't tell them to go nowhere. They've been tangled up. They've been intertwined with them. And so they had no choice but go because the devil himself does not leave heaven without taking a third with him. Oh, but thank God, thank God, thank God. Because that means that now that the, the mess is gone, there's room to sow. There's room to grow. There's room to... Because you are rooted in faith. 
Faith is a dangerous word. <laughs> Did you, you know how powerful belief is? You can sit here and believe you don't feel good, and all of a sudden, you don't. I used to always tease my wife when we were dating because when I drop her off, she go running in the house. And I'm like, what are you running for? She's like, because I thought something was chasing me. I said, it was. It was your imagination. You created it, and you caused it to chase you. Faith is so powerful. When you're rooted in faith. Now, we go back to that mustard seed. He said the mustard seed that is sown can produce a tree so big that even the animals find lodging in it. And if you have the same kind of faith like that size of that seed, your faith that size can move mountains. Now, watch this. People often say they have faith. But their faith is only operable in the things that are seen. They prophes they prophes lie by faith. Come on. Come on. They do. I remember we had a prophet, so-called prophet, came to the church. And the second night, the Lord told me, he showed me everything that man was doing. He had gone online, looked up our Facebook, been on there trying to get familiar. He said he in a hotel room praying. He, no, he was trying to memorize faces that are associated with my Facebook. He started looking at their pages and things that were going on in their lives. And then he walked in our church and set out to deceive. But you know, the Holy Spirit will always reveal. And I'm going to tell you why the Holy Spirit revealed it. Because our church is not a church that craves things. So when he started talking about things, I said, he's way off base. Because we're not seeking things. We're seeking the kingdom. And the kingdom is not meat or drink. It's righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And he tripped up because he called one member by his Facebook name, which is not his real name. Yeah. But this is what I want to say, because he didn't come back. I put him out, but he didn't come back. But, here's, but this is the part I want to say. Do you know we have people in the church that actually got mad because I exposed it? You know what I, I realized? That people want so badly to believe anything. That they will go from place to place to church. Look, don't even go Bible study now. But they will go to a prophet revival for somebody to give somebody the hundred. They don't even give their church. Come on. I, I remember the last time they had this leadership conference in my area. It's like something they do every year. I had to come on Facebook. I said, because if I go on here one more time and I see folks sitting up in somebody's leadership revival and you don't lead nobody. People have bought in to a faith that is not of God. It's not of God. It doesn't even have Jesus as its foundation. I, let me share this with you. What do we believe? I asked my, my assistant on our way to the airport. I said, what do, you, what do you have faith in? And he gave me the answer. I said, that's the right answer. I feel good that you, that you believe that because that's the right answer. What is your faith in? It can't be in money. It can't be in jobs. It can't be in people. 
your faith has to be in the redemptive work that was done one time for us. And that not only did he die, but he rose. Now, let's go there. Let's have some fun. Let's go there. Look, think about this. When Jesus rose from the dead, those folks that had been walking with him for two and a half years had hid themselves in a room because their mindset was, well, they killed him. They're coming for us next. First of all, for them to think he was dead showed they did not have faith. Secondly, he appeared to them in a room and they were freaking out like it was a ghost. So that was another sign they didn't have no faith. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Now, it wasn't a Benny Hinn moment. Because I can imagine they were still so tangled up in their mind that the breathing didn't have any impact at the moment. But then, watch this. They start questioning him. To the point he says, it's me. See, look. Look, this is where they nailed me. This is where they pierced me. It don't hurt no more. <laughs> I'm in my glorified body. So look, so they get excited because they had seen him. Right? So they go running all excited because of what they have seen. So they go and they find Thomas, and Thomas said, well, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to be like I am. I'm just this way. If I don't, I want to not only see his hands, I need to put my finger where the scar was. I need to thrust my hand where it was. Otherwise, I won't believe. believe. Okay, now, did they go back and tell Jesus this? No. Before they could even get back to Jesus, Jesus appears again. This time where Thomas is. And, and he said, Thomas, come on, touch me. Come on. You know what I love about God? He knows what convinces us. He knows what convinces us. And, and so, so, so then Thomas is like, it is you, Lord. It is you. He said, yeah, you blessed. You blessed and highly favored because you've seen me. He said, but there is another sheep. I got sheep that are not of this fold. I'm looking 2,000 years down the road over that little church called City of David. More blessed are they that have not seen, but yet they worship me. Yet they bow down to me. Yet they give me glory. Yet they give me honor. Why? Why do we do these things? Because by faith, we believe. By faith, we believe that he, was, he died, he rose again, and I'm proof. Because there's no reason why I should have life like I have right now. Except there is a resurrection DNA in my DNA. Come on here. Look at somebody and tell them my DNA has resurrection in it. When he got up, I got up too. So, I want to give you this one last example about this faith piece because I want to make sure we all understand what you're rooted in. You're rooted in something that is not seen, yet it is made manifest. You're rooted in, watch this. I, I did a course on miracles because I, I will, God has used me to work miracles, but I didn't understand. And I'm really inquisitive, so I, I wanted to know, God, how does this work? When you tell me to go to the hospital and someone's in a coma, and you tell me to lay hands and they get up, how? Right? And you know, 
what the Lord said to me. He said, dummy. <laughs> hey, he talked to me like that. <laughs> he said, why do you go? And I said, because I believe you sent me. He said, why would I send you somewhere I haven't already been? He said, you're not there to work a miracle. You're there to declare what I've already worked. He said, there ain't no miracle in you. He said, you just are there to declare what I have already done. He said, so the moment you think it's about you, he said, then it's no longer about me. Okay, so I have one more scripture. One more scripture. One more scripture. Matthew 14. Sometimes, you know, when you are preparing, you're like, okay, Lord. <laughs> but this is for someone that God is calling you to do something to prove you're rooted in faith. It's easy to get comfortable in the church because you love your church. Where do you go? I go to the city of David. Ah, right? <laughs> but where are you rooted in faith? In other words, what aspect of your faith is being grown by being here? I've been here all 17 years, and what has manifest? What has City of David done to challenge you, to challenge you and your faith? to go above and beyond your comfort zone. See, some people serve because it's where they want to be. It's where they like it. Oh yeah, I like this church because I'm, I'm gonna sing on the praise team. Can't sing a lick, but you're gonna sing on the praise team. Right, but what has grown in you? Because of you being rooted. What's changed that would not have changed if you had your say? Like, I, I can tell you one that's changed for me in the past year that I have learned to walk in that boldness when I'm not in the pulpit. Because, you know, most people don't realize that Preachers a lot of times are introverts. When we get out of the pulpit, that's it. You don't hear us no more. But the Lord had to show me through me dealing with anxiety, panic disorder. He had to show me the root of it was a lack of faith. Bishop Coates, lacking faith. You can move the mountain for somebody else but you can't see it moving for you. I had gotten so bad off that I, I couldn't, one Sunday I got up to, to preach and I couldn't even talk. I got my stuff and I ran out the door and got in the car and on the way home all I kept saying is I'm losing my mind, I'm losing my mind. I kept saying that. And the Lord said, you can't lose something you've already lost. You said, he said, your mind is in me. He said, now, when you're ready to come up out of that, find yourself back in me, he said, I'll walk you out of it. And I came back four months later, better, stronger, bolder. First course of action was to tell some people, you got to go. <laughs> God didn't say I had to pastor you. I passed the sheep, not wolves. I said, and I have the right to tell you, you are no longer necessary here. You need to go find somewhere else to be. And 
I said, and anybody else that don't like it, you're going now too. And Bishop, things got better. I got better. But this is what he said. Here's the challenge. Over there in that text, it's the story where Jesus tells his disciples, get in the boat, go to the other side. I'll meet you. He's sending them where he will go. He goes up into a mountain to pray. And in the wee hours, he stops praying. And he's like, now I'm going to go to the other side. Now, he don't take no boat. He walks on water. Okay. So Jesus is walking on water, and he is uh, on his way to the other side. And he almost passes by them, headed to the other side, like he's not looking for them in the water because he sent them to the other side. Sometimes we're asking God, where are you in this? He said, I'm not there. I'm where I'm sending you. Because if I sent you there, even this storm is going to get you there. Watch this. So they're in the middle of the world. They're rowing and struggling in the storm. And here he comes. And look at this. They think he's a ghost. They are crying out, thinking it's a ghost. And he said, it is I. Now, Peter says, any Peters in this room? You know, you outspoken. You just going to be the one. Peter said, well, if it is you. If it is you. Notice now, he has not said it is you. He didn't say, oh, hey, Jesus. No, he said, if it's you, then let me do what you're doing. Let me walk on water. Jesus says, come on. Come on, big mouth. Let's go. Step out the boat. The others in the boat is like, what you looking at us for? He talking to you right up. We staying in here. If you smart, you stay in here too. So Peter's getting out the boat. They're like, look at that fool. He done lost his, well, you know he ain't never been wrapped too tight. <laughs> oh, well, here he go. He know he can't walk on the water. Peter's getting out, and Peter is doing something Peter shouldn't be able to do. He is walking on water. Now, the mistake that people make is they call it faith. He didn't have faith. He had permission. Can I run? Can I? There are some people in this room right now. God is saying, I don't know why you're waiting on faith. I gave you permission. Peter is walking because he said, come on. If the Lord tells you to do it. Ain't nothing magical about it. Just keep your eye on him and do it. Peter started sinking. You know why he was sinking? Because he wasn't rooted in faith. He wasn't rooted in faith yet. His sinking was a lesson. It was, first of all, you'll never forget this moment. Because you walked on water. He said, but you'll never forget this moment because when you could have kept walking on water, you started sinking. What did Jesus say to him when he started sinking? Oh, ye of what? Little faith. What is the Lord saying to us? If we're rooted in faith. That means we're ready now as grown folks, grown people faith. Grown people faith ain't just sitting there praying about the bill. <laughs> grown people, grown people faith ain't sitting up in a mega church hiding. Because you don't want tithe, you don't want to be a part of, you just want to be a casual saint. Using some sorry excuse, you got hurt. You get hurt anywhere. 
You can hurt on your job, but you go. You can hurt in your house with your family, but you still go home. You're rooted in faith. My closing remarks first is thank you for extending this opportunity. Because when I was praying for you, I saw you had been in a struggle and you're recovering. What's to come is so much greater than what was. Brother, I know a church that's good ground. I know. I've, I've been some places where I was like, okay, Lord, <laughs> not here. I felt fire all up around here. And I felt the Lord saying, this church is like the seed that is sown. Keep saying seed. That the farmer gets up day and night looking. And it grows, but he don't know how. First, a blade, then the flower, then the fruit. That's where you are now. You have produced a harvest of fruit that are ready to be planted again and produce more. Amen. Bishop, you have to be looking at your successor because you can't be in too many places at one time. Amen. This is not your only location. I hear the Lord said, you did with this what I wanted you to do. You turned this from a building into kingdom. And some people, I don't even know them, but some people question why you spent the money to do this. Why are we doing this? Well, you know why? Because when the Lord wants to abide somewhere, he says how he wants it to look. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And those that look with the naked eye, they miss the spiritual blessing. Yes, this is good ground. Yes. Yes. This is good ground. Yes. There's a harvest coming in this season in this church that you're going to be looking around saying, do we have any more chairs? Amen. Everybody lift your hands right now. Father, I thank you for the word you've given to us today. May this word fall on good ground. Not thorny ground. Not stony ground. But that the hearers of this word are receiving this because they intend to be a product of what they received this weekend in workshops, in the preach word, the talk word, that they will bring forth out of what is sown into their lives. And Father, thank you that every need is met. In fact, Father, thank you that visions are being resurrected. Things that people saw as a business plan, pull it back out, finish it. Don't think about the money, think about the one who gave you the vision. If God gave you a vision, God has provision already in place. You're looking at a brother walking on faith. And I refuse to look down because if I look down, I will sink. Don't look down. Keep looking at the one that has empowered you. Many of you are going to bless this church in so many ways because it's your heart's desire. You're going to be one of those people that just keeps seeding. Church is going to keep adding and multiplying because you are on good ground. Hallelujah. So, Father, thank you now that even in this season, thank you for the miracles. Thank you for the manifestation of your presence, not only in the worship, but even when they leave this place and they go to their jobs and they go to the community, into the marketplace, that you begin to draw your people. Draw them unto you. God, we thank you that this is not a brand, but this is you, Jesus. You being glorified. You being lifted up. Because you said if you be lifted up, you'll draw men. 
keep these people rooted in the faith in Jesus Christ. Not in things, but in eternal reward. In Jesus' name. Everybody give God the best praise you got. Come on. Come on and give him the best praise you got. Come on and give him the best you got. God, I'm on good ground. God, I'm moving because you gave me permission. God, I'm walking on water because you gave me permission. I'm like a tree planted by rivers of water. I'm going to bring forth my fruit in my season. Everything I do shall prosper and nothing shall wither because I'm rooted in faith. God bless you. We love you guys so much. Thank you so much.